How much would you spend on a video game console? Right now, the newest consoles are $499 for the most expensive models. Of course, resellers will sell them for an enormous profit. It's alright. If there's a god, he'll watch out for us. But seriously, how much would you spend on gaming? Back in 1993, the competition was fierce between many different electronic companies to cram themselves in the business as Nintendo did almost a decade ago. The two famous combatants were Nintendo with the Super Nintendo and Sega with the Genesis slash Mega Drive. Both consoles at the time would be a little less than asking price of consoles today, though the games would be a lot more money once adjusted for inflation, averaging at over $100 a piece. NEC also attempted this price range when releasing the TurboGrafx-16. One problem... Here's the thing. I don't give a shit about TurboGrafx-16. But some companies decided to stir the pot. Some knew that if you wanted games with a little bit more prowess, you needed to fork over the dough. During a time which most consoles lacked the hardware to carry over every aspect seen in an arcade machine, where most console ports made sacrifices so that a port could be seen as at all possible, SNK's Neo Geo vowed to ignore this limitation by improving its hardware. This is, of course, for a steep price. EA released 3DO, a console that promised full-blown 3D graphics and spectacular full-motion video games. Of course, with such large promises came the hefty price of $699, over $1,000 in today's money. Finally, we reach the Philips CDI, a console that only lives in infamy amongst the gaming culture for what it did to Nintendo's most iconic franchises. Keep in mind, their most anticipated games look like this. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. And the launch price was $1,000, though some sites claim it was $700. This is thanks to it also being a CD player. You're paying over $2,000 in today's money for a CD player with shitty games. But one console thought it could rise above the rest. Be the cream of the crop. Enter the Laser Active. A console that costs multiple house mortgages to own. This punchline of modern gaming was created by Pioneer, a company made famous for crafting handy technology, mostly emphasizing car audio electronics. So when the dickhead with a really loud bass pulls up next to you at a stoplight, the dude who always blasts a song that sounds like an orgy of rabid raccoons, remember to thank Pioneer for making their asshole behavior possible. But none of that matters. Pioneer had a huge hand developing laser discs. What are laser discs? You ask because you only know Richard Nixon thanks to Futurama? Actually, some of my audience may be too young to remember Futurama. In short, they were a media format in the late 70s that didn't gain any sort of traction in America until the 90s, where soon after, it was replaced by the CD and DVD format, meaning that the main selling point of the console was that it could play an entertainment format that not only wasn't super popular, but was already on death's door. The pros of Laserdisc were, it played video slash audio better. The cons were, it was super fragile, extremely expensive compared to its counterparts, the technology to play it cost an arm and a leg, and the discs were enormous. And, unlike VHS, it couldn't record TV programs. Quite the deal if you ask me, though it was popular in some parts of Asia. After seeing the meteoric rise of video game popularity in America, along with the success of Japanese publishers over in the West, Pioneer hatched a scheme for how they could implement these markets in a brand new hardware. The Laser Active was released to the excitement of... someone, I'm sure, releasing at the price of $970 in 1993 which, once calculated for inflation, is around $2,000. This is a price not unheard of, as I brought up the Philips CDI, but nevertheless still ludicrous if they expect to take off for the masses. But wait! There's more! To help gain attention, Pioneer built a deal with Sega and NEC to create module packs to attach to the console. These modules would play Sega Genesis along with Sega CD games and TurboGrafx-16 games respectively. Although this sounds like an interesting idea, as now you have two big names helping you. Okay, one big name, but the Turbo Graphics wasn't bad. I see good things about Turbo Graphics 16. Also, this posed a terrible problem for the consumers. You see, the modules made by Sega and NEC cost $600 each in 1993, meaning for one module you had to pay today's equivalent to around $1,230. You'd pay this much to play games that were on a console that was exponentially cheaper. Also, in case you weren't interested in paying over $3,000 to play video games, the modules were required to play all of the games in the base console. If you wanted to play Time Gal, for example, a game that was already released on Sega CD, you not only needed the base laser active, but also the Sega module. If you had no module, or heaven forbid, the NEC module, you'd be shit out of luck. This applies to all 19 games in the US. Yep, 19 games were released outside Japan, all of them being priced at $120 each. 
Once again, adjusted for inflation, that's $245. Most of them were either edutainment games or games laden with quick time events, meaning for the ability to play a single player video game on this thing, you were required to pay the modern equivalent to $3,462. That's also if you bought only one of the two modules. If you want both, add another $1,230. And let's be real, one video game isn't going to entertain you forever. Let's add two more. Even still, that's not all the modules. There are still three more I haven't talked about. The Karaoke PAC was a module that allowed you to play karaoke on it. Something I couldn't imagine being an easy sell to a gamer in 1993. Especially with the fact that it was priced at $350, today's equivalent to $717.37. Another module gave the console a computer interface. It came with a floppy disk program that can be installed in your computer, which installed the Laser Active Editing program. The price for this is unknown, but I assume if you could afford it, you're playing it inside of your private jet to Luxembourg. Finally, the Blast module was a pair of 3D goggles. Once you put these on, Wikipedia says they'd be able to employ an active shutter 3D system to be used in compatibility with six games, most of them Japanese exclusive. But I like to imagine that once you put the goggles on, a big old middle finger came out of your TV to remind you that you likely spent over $6,000 in today's money on a console that runs on a dying format that has 19 games over here. What weirds me out the most about the console is, who was this for? There aren't enough edutainment games to warrant a parent buying this for their kid, Plus, it'd be insane to spend this kind of money on it. Hardcore gamers only need to glance at the lackluster collection of games to realize the console's not for them. Rich kids also won't get any sort of entertainment value or bragging rights from owning this thing. And all four Laserdisc enthusiasts will just buy a normal player instead of paying extra for the potential ability to play crap games. You can maybe argue for its ability to play games from two different consoles, except it's at a price much steeper than any of the other two. Combined. Nevertheless, this console is a failure in every aspect. The fact that a group of executives not only conceived, but went through this financial suicide mission only has me pray that they are all now banned from even looking in the direction of a video game. But what if I told you that this was the most expensive console ever released? As there is a console that was actually in development and planned to be much more costly. That being RDI Video Systems' very own cancelled project, the Halcyon. First question, who's RDI? In the 1980s, RDI released a game called Zizix. Then, once they figured out that you could use more than three letters in a game title, they created Dragon Slayer, a game that stood the test of time for its impressive graphics, despite being created in 1982. Now, soon afterward, they followed up with Space Ace in 1983. Yes, the same one JonTron talked about. Now, these games were infamous for their high prices. In the arcade, one game cost $2.50, close to $8 today, and it's not exactly hard to die in Dragon Slayer. Oddly enough, in 1985, they permanently shut down. What an anomaly! Someone may ask, how could someone with two games that despite the high price sold like hotcakes, just fall so soon afterward? Rick Dyer, the man the company is named after, witnessed the immense success seen in his games in the arcade, and whilst enjoying his ocean of cash, he asked himself a daring question. I wonder if I can make a game console with the technology to run my games. Because if a Super Nintendo can't run your games, what hope does an Atari 2600 have? And from there, production started as he gambled his profits on a new tomorrow. The Halcyon was planned to be released in January of 1985 at the cost of $2,500. In today's money, that would be... But the FLAPPIN' FLOSSOM, WHAT'S THAT?! Now let me repeat that. It was going to be released in 1985 for $2,500. Other than the price, what's wrong with that sentence? If you don't know video game history, an infamous event took place, the American video game crash of 83. Due to the multitude of problems with the then video game industry, the market for video games was the poorest it ever has been, where most of the biggest names in the industry either found refuge in other markets or sunk with a ship. This is until Nintendo releases the NES. So why on earth anyone thought it was a great idea to not only release a console during this time, but release it for a price like that baffles me. This would be like right now if I released a Tamagotchi player worth $7,000. I don't think I need to tell you any more about this doomed hardware, but I will anyway. According to RDI, the console is planned to be voice activated. Using 1985 technology, yeah, I'm sure that would have gone well. According to the marketing, the console, again 1985, was going to have artificial intelligence. Ready for this? Which they claimed was akin to HAL 9000. They themselves said their console would be like HAL 9000. And I guess the best way would be to use, uh, if, if 
you remember the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, there was a computer in that movie called Hal. You know, the robot from 2001 A Space Odyssey who ends up killing most of the space crew out of malicious intent? Guess what? The console also used laser discs. To be completely fair, the system itself was built to be something like a prototype of the modern day Siri or Alexa. Though the main focus was to be a console, Dyer himself claimed that the program was going to also function as a robot assistant. Even saying this, uh, the computer will say, uh, John, did you did you just go to get a snack? Well, I Imagine coming back to your game and your PC asked if you washed your hands. The general public wasn't ready for this sort of technology. The investors saw the pieces fall into place. The console was expensive to manufacture and high risk for consumers. One by one, every investor bailed on Rick Dyer, the man who put all of his eggs in one basket just to then accidentally sit on it. The entire operation shut down, and since Rick Dyer gambled his company's stability on it and lost, RDI went the way of the dodo. Researching prices on this episode, I feel like my eyes have been opened. All I can say is I'm glad gaming's cheaper now than it's ever been. And unlike the era of the Wild West, where some whack job in a suit can force you to pay thousands of dollars to pay one game, nowadays the entire console market's stabilized. Today DLC seems to be a hotly debated topic among gamers, along with some of the ethics behind certain practices. Though some are still scummy, all I can say is, at least it's optional. I'm not required to pay exorbitant fees in order for the game to even be playable. The most expensive piece of hardware in the market would be gaming PCs which at least also function as a powerful computer alongside their main function. This isn't excusing terrible behavior, more an appreciation for how controlled the market is now. With that said, bye for now.